the ice industry became possible in Mayville when the railroad came to the village. Previously, there had been no practical way to ship ice, but the railroad made cheap and easy shipping possible. Cities like Cleveland, Buffalo, and Pittsburgh needed large quantities of ice to meet the demands of food storage. The first of Mayville's large ice houses, operated by the Chautauqua Lake Ice Company, opened for business in 1871. This picture, which was taken in 1874, shows the ice house to the right of the first railroad station. Notice that the railroad bed ran out into the lake. The location is still the same, but the lakefront surrounding the area has been filled in during the intervening years. The first ice house, seen to the left of the railroad depot, was sold after a few years and became the property of the Pittsburgh Ice Company, which started operations in 1875. While most employees worked only during the winter months, some worked year-round like the ice house manager. This ice house, which was located elsewhere on Lake Chautauqua, but the mustached man out in front appears to be Joe Ocker, who managed the Pittsburgh Ice Company. A house was provided by the company for him and his family. The Pittsburgh Ice Manager's house stood near the old iron bridge used by the Chautauqua Traction Company trolleys to cross over top of the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks early in the 20th century. Mrs. Ocker and two of her children are seen standing in front of the nearby bridge. The Iron Bridge can be seen more fully here. It stood approximately where Route 394 now runs past the west side of Mayville's Park. The Pittsburgh Ice House, which had been previously damaged in a windstorm, burned to the ground on December 3, 1920. Mayville resident George Morton, then a youngster, was taken up on this Iron Bridge by his parents to watch the fire. Twelve acres of the Ice House property were purchased to be a park by Mayville in 1934 when Andy Carlson was mayor. Although controversial at the time, it has since become a valuable part of the village. Two ice houses and a railroad station can be located on this 1881 map of Mayville. This picture, which shows the steamboat docks in front of the railroad station, also shows the Chautauqua Lake Ice Company's second large ice house, which began operating in 1875. It continued operating until 1915, when the company discovered that they could manufacture ice more cheaply at their building in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The first two ice houses can be seen on either side of the original railroad depot building. Both of them are located south of the depot building. This house situated on the lake opposite the road that leads up to Mayville's VFW. The surrounding property was once the location of Cornell and Hughes Ice House. It was not inside village limits while the ice industry existed. This property was part of land that was annexed by the village of Mayville in 1956. Cornell and Hughes was sold to the City Ice and Fuel Company of Cleveland, Ohio. They took over operations in 1920. All the large ice houses had some common features. One of these, roof ventilators, can be easily seen in this picture. Another common feature was a railroad siding where boxcars could be loaded with ice bound for the cities. Chautauqua Lake ice was considered to be very good quality and was much in demand. This sign, which went on the side of an ice-filled boxcar ready to ship, is in the Chautauqua Township Historical Society's Mayville Depot Museum. Another ice-related item in the Society's collection is this home delivery sign. It was hung out front of the house to indicate what size block of ice was to be delivered by the ice man. The weight displayed right side up was the correct amount. In this case, it would be 25 pounds. Looking across the lakeside of Cornell and Hughes, another common feature of the ice houses, the ice elevator, can be seen. In this closer picture, the elevator can be more easily seen along with another common feature of the large ice houses, ladders going up the side of the building for workers to use. Seen from the opposite end of the building, both the ice elevator 
and the roof ventilators are easily spotted. Cakes of ice were plain to the right thickness before they were taken inside the ice house and stored. Cornell and Hughes, at one time, had a slush conveyor that took the ice shavings away at a right angle to the building and deposited them in a large pile outside of the building. Because of the weight of the conveyor and the ice it carried, it had to be guided up, as can be seen in this picture. The conveyor and the associated tower as seen from a location near the ice planer. The relationship between all these operations and their layout is shown in this picture taken facing south. The blocks of ice were carried up the ice elevator where they were skidded inside for storage while awaiting shipment by railroad. This was the Cornell and Hughes Ice House Manager's living quarters. Back at Mayville's railroad station again, the steamboat dock that belonged to the railroad can be seen stretching 350 feet out into the lake. Railroad workers chopped ice away from the pilings during the winter so that the ice would not destroy it when it shifted during spring season. To the right end of the dock, the large Hobson's Ice Company building can be seen in the distance. The ice was also used for enjoying oneself. This couple are two of a group of ice skaters near the end of the steamboat dock in wintertime. Ice fishing was and still is very popular on Lake Chautauqua. Oscar Irwin is standing beside his ice shanty displaying two large fish that he caught. Ice boating is not new to Lake Chautauqua either. This large vessel had two sails. Ice boating is still popular on the lake when conditions are right. Ice could be associated with the business of railroad operations. Large icicles like this often formed on the water tower that stood to the south of the railroad depot. It was used to provide water for the boilers of steam locomotives. Looking north along the lake side of the present dive building, where both the Chautauqua Township Historical Society Museum and Cable Access 5 Studios are located, another building can be seen. In early 1996, this building belongs to Chautauqua Opportunities Incorporated. This is the same building when it was the GLF Mill. An older mill building stands behind it. This older building was part of Chautauqua Lake Mills and part of the Hobson Ice Company building can be seen behind it. Going down toward the lake and around the building's corner a bit, the railroad tracks and loading area come into view. Out on the lake, ice operations took place in several stages. If there was snow on the lake, it had to be cleared away so that the ice field could be harvested and also so that the lake could, ice could thicken in cold weather. If the snow was hard, it might need to be broken up with disks. Mayville resident and photographer John Bowman is setting on this set of disks. Snow had to be cleared away and horses were used out on the ice field during most of the ice industry's existence. This ice field is being prepared for harvesting operations. The ice was cut into long grooves with horse-drawn ice saws like this one in the Chautauqua Township Historical Society's museum. Buffalo mittens were popular for keeping ice man's hands warm during the era when they were available. Toward the end of the ice industry, gas-powered ice saws were used to cut the grooves in the ice rather than the horse-drawn saws. This faded picture shows the saw that was used by Hobson's Ice Company. Some power saws, like this one used by the Mayville Ice Company, cut two grooves at a time. Power ice saws were pulled along behind by two men. The first long grooves cut into the ice by horse-drawn saws did not quite cut all the way through to the water below. If they did cut through, water would well up into the cracks and refreeze, making it impossible to harvest the ice. The cuts were completed with a handsaw like this one displayed with other ice tools in the Mayville Depot Museum. 
Here the first cuts in the ice field have been made preparatory to the beginning of the harvest. Many of the teams used in the ice industry, terms used in the ice industry are related to farming. This should come as no surprise since many of the hundreds of workers hired during the winter were farmers. Ice in the field was cut into long grooved sheets, two cakes wide, that were called floats. The floats were moved up a channel by men using pikes until they were near the ice elevator. On the lake and near the elevator, the floats were broken into individual cakes of ice and guided into the ice elevator. This is the ice elevator at Hobson's Ice Company. Ice went up the elevator and over the top of the railroad tracks so as not to interfere with railroad operations. The ice was then moved along the side of the Hobson Ice Company building which had six interior rooms for storing ice. A platform on the side of the building was raised or lowered depending on the level of the ice inside. Ice was stacked inside the building in a manner that would allow it to be insulated by straw or sawdust and later easily broken apart for shipping. Hobson's ice elevator can be seen on the right along with the tracks it went over. This picture was probably taken because the engine seen here is derailed. This January 1989 picture shows three cement foundations that held the elevator. This type of ice, which forms without snow on top, is now known as black ice. During the heyday of the ice industry, it was called blue ice because of the color seen when one looked through it. This was considered to be the very best grade of ice available. Hobson's last ice harvest took place in 1927. The roof of the 150 by 190 foot building collapsed and it was de demolished for the estimated 250,000 square feet of salvageable lumber in 1929. This picture, which was made from a glass plate negative, shows ice being put into a horse-drawn sleigh to be taken off the lake. This may have been for a private individual or a small business. North along the lake shore, one comes to this house on Burden Tree Road. It's where a large ice house was built by Ben Hobson and Gus Carlson in 1888. Hobson sold out his interest so he could build the previously seen ice house, which started operations in 1900. Carlson's ice house burned down in November 1909. The fire lifted large sections of the roof into the air and hurled them out into the lake. Remains of ice machinery were left rusting away for many years afterward. Here we are looking down present day Sea Lion Drive near where Bird and Tree Road enters from the south. This is the same area where the Mayville Ice Company had their ice house. The ice house was originally built by a Hobson, but was later owned by the Fishers, so it became known as Fisher Ice House. The original road was put in from Lakeview Avenue, then Railroad Avenue, to serve the ice house. Seen here is the boiler room, which held the engine, powering the endless chain, which carried ice from the channel to the ice house. The end of this house originally incorporated the walls of the boiler room. And seen again in greater detail. It, of course, had its own railroad siding for loading box cars with ice, along with many previously seen features common to all large ice houses. Fishers had four interior rooms for holding ice, as can be seen in this side shot. And closer details of the ladders and loading area. Photographer John O. Bowman, seen on the ice field near Fishers in 1921, and again alongside the channel, which was dug from the lake to the ice house. Looking up the channel from the lake to the ice house. Men using pikes to pull the ice along the channel towards the ice elevator. And this area is where the channel used to be located. It has since been filled in. The large building to the left was the boathouse of John Hall, an Oklahoma oil man who erected the second building on the street. And the street was extended to accommodate him. This boathouse held his boat, the Lina Jane, 
which is kept in a dredge channel out front during warmer months. The channel curved around towards the ice house on the end nearest present day Sea Lion Drive. The individual cakes of ice then went up and along the endless chain toward the ice house and was moved inside by hand to be stacked and stored. Ice was sometimes harvested and stored outside by ice companies who did not have an ice house building. Fishers erected this frame outside one particularly good year. Details of their two roof ventilators can be made out in this picture of the frame. Here, workers are getting ready to stack ice inside of the frame and with a few layers of ice stacked. Echoes of the past ring out as a present day ice field is cleared near the location of Mayville's first ice house. Its ice has been used to build the ice castle which honors an industry that employed hundreds of workers in Mayville during its peak years. Learn to eat smart. Research has shown that high fiber foods may reduce the risk of colon cancer. Fiber is found in breads, cereals, and other foods made from whole grain. Fruits and vegetables are also excellent sources of fiber. Eating the skin or peel will boost fiber intake, as will adding chopped prunes or figs to your morning cereal. Try fresh fruits and vegetables for lunch or snacks. And once a week for dinner, Try a main dish made from high fiber vegetables such as beans or dried peas. Eating a variety of foods high in fiber is eating smart and a sensible, enjoyable way to reduce your risk of certain cancers. This message brought to you by the Produce Marketing Association, the University of Delaware, and the American Cancer Society.